Let us pray. Gracious Holy God, let it be with us this day, according to your word and your will and your way. Amen. <clears throat> Pride and humility. They're not inherently opposites, though as siblings they do not always get along well. They're not always a positive influence upon one another. One thing that preaching professors stress is to be very sparing in talking about ourselves. When we do, it should be out of humility rather than pride. It should be for the thriving of the whole, the beloved community, the shalom of God's desires for our greatest potential as creatures, as creations of the divine self-outpouring of compassion. A very wise person recently said to me, <clears throat> stories change us. So today I want to tell you a few stories about myself. Not for self-aggrandizement, nor to convince, or to coerce, or to justify. I was seven or so. I was probably supposed to be taking a nap. My brother John, four years younger, was napping. Mom was probably downstairs. I went into my parents' room. I'm not sure what I was looking for. I opened Mom's dresser and found her lipstick. I stood in front of the mirror and smeared it on my lips. And then I saw Mom's reflection in the mirror. <laughs> to her credit, she did not say, you're not a girl. Or, boys don't do that. Or, shame on you. She did not squash or humiliate my exploration of expression. She said, Paul, you don't need that. You're already beautiful. I took that to mean I was good. Instead of the warmth of humiliation, I felt the warmth of love. Around the same age, I was playing with neighborhood friends in the sandbox across the alley. I was the oldest among a group of boys ranging between my age and my younger brothers. It was getting hot. It had recently rained, so it was getting muggy. I suggested to my playmates that we remove our clothes, and they complied. We were oblivious to the fact that in that relatively new housing development, there were no mature trees and very few fences. We were visible from the kitchens of a dozen houses. But why should we have cared? Later, before supper, my parents called me into the living room. They asked me to do what I had done with my playmates. I reluctantly removed my clothes. With the dawning realization that perhaps some neighboring parents had complained and held me responsible. What could have resulted in humiliating shame was tempered somewhat by, by what my parents said. You, Paul, should never be ashamed of your body. And you should be aware of the influence that you have on others and how it might harm them, whether you mean it or not. 
Eventually, I understood that that meant I should never use my power to exercise control over someone else's body. That, of course, has wide-ranging implications. It didn't exactly instill body pride, but it didn't mire me in body shame either. It rescued me from some of the temptations of patriarchy. Third, around the same time, my dad was pastor at a large congregation in a South Dakota university town, not unlike Pioneer in Walla Walla. You may have heard me refer to what he called his most moving sermon ever the Easter sermon in which he suggested that there is more than one way to understand atonement. The next day, he got the call from the district superintendent that he would be moving to a new appointment that year. What I did not know until I was in seminary was that he had also been trying to initiate a conversation about full inclusion for gay and lesbian persons in that congregation in 1966. That congregation became the first in the Dakotas to proclaim full inclusion nearly 50 years later. I like to think that the seeds that he planted, the ground that he tilled, helped to lead to their liberating expression of the gospel of God's unconditional love and expectation of justice. Fast forward a decade. In my sophomore year of high school, I was elected to represent the North Central jurisdiction of the United Methodist Church on the National United Methodist Council on Youth Ministry. The council was proud of its radical positions on social issues. The rules required that of the two elected from each jurisdiction each year to two-year terms, at least one must be non-male and at least one must be non-white. I supported that effort and its intent. I arrived at the first council meeting somewhat ashamed with my white female colleague. The next year, the mostly non-male, non-white council elected me president. Humility and pride were at war in my heart. It was around that time that my dad's district superintendent sat me down to say he sensed a call to ministry in me. I foolishly responded that I thought it would be too easy for me to follow that path. Little did I know how grueling and humbling that path is. Also during that time, I attended the 1976 General Conference of the United Methodist Church in Portland. It was the first time the issue of sexual orientation was discussed openly during the plenary session. I was appalled at what I heard. I could not believe that so many who claim to follow Jesus would always also speak so hatefully against LGBTQ plus persons and so forcefully against their full inclusion in the life and ministry of the church. Some of those voices tried to soften the blow by saying they hated the sin and loved the sinner. I was ashamed to be United Methodist. I most certainly did not want to be a part of such an institution. I began quietly to quit the church. I prayed for a different vocation, a different calling. I was artistic and good at math. I had been a fan of Frank Lloyd Wright, who was also a preacher's kid. 
And so eventually I found my way to architecture. That path is part of a different story, as is the path from architecture back into the church and ordained ministry. But architecture opened up the world to me. I studied in Europe. I studied and worked side by side with talented, compassionate Jews and Muslims and Hindus and gays and lesbians and immigrants from Argentina, Mexico, India, the Philippines, France, and Kenya. Mary and I lived in New York City during the outbreak You know, the outbreak of the HIV AIDS crisis. And we sat with dear dying friends and wept at their memorials. It's Pride Month. In some ways, we assume pride is a good thing. I mean, pride which is the opposite of shame. We want to be able to say with authenticity to our children, I am so proud of you. That's a compliment, right? It's certainly in opposition to shame. Both pride and shame have internal and external aspects. Society, including the church, attempts and often succeeds at imposing shame. Even the person with the most robust confidence at peace with themselves, secure in their identity, can wither under the pressure of shame, even implied shame. And who does not want a respected elder or trusted friend to say to them, I am so proud of you. On the other hand, we hold a deeply seated critique of pride, overly simplistic interpretations of Genesis 2-3 account of creation, often attribute the so-called fall and supposed depravity of humanity to the sin of pride. Not to mention the hubris of those in Genesis 11 who built the Tower of Babel. Sadly, dangerously, insidiously, we seem not to have learned that lesson well. Today, in our time and place, there is an insurgence of hubris feeding the phenomenon known as Christian nationalism, its own kind of Tower of Babel. Christian nationalism is a political ideology that claims America was founded to be and should remain a so-called Christian nation, despite the clear intent of the Constitution to separate church and state and to honor religious liberty to all. Christian nationalism merges our religious and civic identities, proclaiming that only conservative Christians are true Americans. Christian nationalism can be identified not just by its rhetoric, but also by its theocratic policy agenda. Despite Jesus' commandments to love, adherents advocate for oppressive legislation rooted in far-right religious beliefs that strips away equal rights from the queer community, non-Christians, women, people of color, immigrants, among others. Christian nationalism doesn't just attack democracy and equal rights. It also drives people away from the church, giving us Christians multiple pressing reasons to respond. 
We must side with vulnerable communities. And we must reclaim our own identity and prophetic voice. Ironically, Christian nationalism relies on the same misplaced pride that is associated with exclusion and control, while the pride of the queer community celebrates diversity and freedom and the innate original blessing of the Creator. God saw them and said, it is very good. The pride that we celebrate with the rainbow flag is humble pride. I want that kind of pride for and with my beloved community. Psalm 131 is about humility. And Eugene Peterson tells us that in it he sees a moderating or mediating message. Like a just weaned infant, the pilgrim is in the moment, the tension between the insatiable hunger of the newborn and the willful demands of the toddler. God is the mother who has weaned her children, perhaps a little emptied of power and reluctant to control, but expectant and hopeful for her offspring, that they will remain rooted in the earth of her love. Every mother wants her children to thrive, but not at the cost of thriving for her other children. One wonders how God sorrows as she watches children taken from their parents at the borders of our nation, supposedly a nation rooted in Christian ethics and commitments. The message paraphrase of Psalm 131 says, we should not meddle where we have no business. And so it would be well to be clear about where our business is as individual pilgrims as well as a pilgrim people on our way to the city of the peace of God. On this bold and never quite completed journey of faith, at least not from what we have seen in this life, we pass through regions of hurt and hunger as well as regions of justice and joy. Nowadays, the regions of hurt and hunger seem closer to our path. Perhaps the paths we have chosen as individuals and as a people have generated some or even most of the hurt and hunger. If we're so intent upon marching to Zion, the state of perfection beyond our earthly cares, we are unlikely to tarry in those hungry, hurting places. And if we care too much for our life, for what we will eat or drink, or about our body, what we will wear, we may not even set out on that journey. Our business as followers of Jesus is to stand with those close to the ground. The journey of faith is not an easy one, not always pleasant, often challenging. Last Sunday, I said in a kind of preamble to my sermon, I'm going to say some things that some of you may disagree with. And that's okay. Unanimity is not required for community. I believe with all my heart that gender and sexual orientation have no bearing on salvation. But they have everything to do with liberation. With John Wesley, I believe that we all have a part to play in our own salvation, the healing of our entire being and its relationship to the source of being. I humbly submit that we all, as the body of Christ, have a part to play in each other's liberation. I believe there is nothing 
sinful or depraved about loving someone of the same sex and engaging in loving physical and emotional intimacy with them. What is sinful is when sex or anything, even religion, is used to control, demean, harm, humiliate, or shame someone. What is sinful is when sex or anything else, even religion, is used to control, demean, harm, humiliate, or shame someone. Like Adam Hamilton, I do not use statistics to determine doctrine, nor do I use science to validate the gospel though I am relieved that science does not undermine my understanding of God's unconditional love and expectation of justice. I do not use Scripture to dictate the meaning of love, but I do use love to unveil the meaning of Scripture. Take a deep breath. <laughs> Once again, some words from the poet, prophet, Steve Garnis Holmes, with a little spin by yours truly. There are two religions in the world. The religion of being right and the religion of being loving. They are incompatible. Get it right and you may hurt someone. Love and you may break a rule. We are always practicing one or the other every moment, always choosing. This is Jesus' faith in a nutshell. Not religious orthodoxy, but loving behavior. Not being right, but being loving. I know this and believe it deeply. And Jesus' words stick. Love one another as I have loved you.